In October of 2022, President Joe Biden directed the Attorney General and Health and Human Services to evaluate the current Schedule One status of cannabis under the Federal Controlled Substances Act. On August 29th, the HHS applied an eight-factor test under Section 811 of the Controlled Substances Act and sent its findings over to the Drug Enforcement Administration. So what happens next? When will Schedule 3 cannabis actually be here? And what does that mean for you? That's what we've got for you today, so let's get into it. Where we talk all the time about reclassifying a controlled substance from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 under the CSA, it requires a comprehensive evaluation process involving the HHS and DEA. The HHS must review the following elements for reclassifying a controlled substance, the potential for abuse of the substance, the scientific evidence and the pharmacological evidence of the substance, the state of current scientific knowledge regarding the substance, the history and current pattern of abuse of the substance, the scope, duration, and significance of the abuse of the substance, the risk to public health of the abuse of the substance, the potential of the substance to produce psychic or physiological dependence, whether the substance is an immediate precursor or the substance already controlled under the Controlled Substances Act. The HHS considered all of these eight elements when they directed the DEA and said that it should be moved to Schedule 3. This kicks off a cascade of events under the Controlled Substances Act. We expect the following in the future that will move cannabis to Schedule 3. An agency decides to develop a new rule or amend it an existing rule. Then there is an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, the ANPRM. The agency publishes the ANPRM in the Federal Register to seek public input on the need for the rule and potential alternatives. Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or NPRM. The agency publishes an NPRM in the Federal Register to propose specific changes to the regulations. The NPRM must include detailed explanations of the proposed changes, the reasons for the changes, and the analysis of the potential impacts of those changes. Then, a public comment period. The public has a period of time to submit comments to the NPRM. The comment period is typically 30 to 60 days. It may be longer or shorter depending on the complexity of the rule. Then there's the review of the public comments. The agency reviews all public comments submitted on the NPRM. The agency may also hold public hearings to gather additional input. Then the final rule. The agency publishes a final rule in the Federal Register and adopts a proposed changes, adopts modified changes to the proposed rule, and then that final rule must include the response to all significant public comments. Then there's the judicial review. The public may challenge the final rule in court, and you know someone that hates weed will probably resort to that. The Attorney General has not yet announced a date for publishing the ANPRM on the rescheduling of cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 under the CSA. However, the Department of Justice has stated that it is committed to reviewing the classification of cannabis and that it will make a decision based on the latest scientific evidence. These notices come out regularly throughout the year, so stay tuned to our channel for more updates on it. When would Schedule 3 status take effect for cannabis? When an agency publishes the final rule, Generally, the rule is effective no less than 30 days after the date of publication in the Federal Register. This means that cannabis can be Schedule 3 pretty quickly if the Attorney General publishes the proposed rule and proposes a 60-day public comment period. It could be rescheduled in a matter of months, not years. However, it may stay in Schedule 3 four years because of what I think was the reason that it was not completely dropped off the Controlled Substances Act. The same section, 811, that allows the Attorney General to change the scheduling of a substance also incorporates international laws into our own federal drug policy. So that is something else that you need to know about Schedule 3 cannabis. It will not be completely legalized because international law won't allow it. The Attorney General has to listen to international law because it's built into the CSA. And so to drop cannabis from the schedules entirely would conflict with international law. The United States agreed to the same convention of the Narcotics and Drug Act back in 1961 and then incorporated that into the CSA in 1970. In the International Narcotics Control Board's 2022 annual report, it raised a number of concerns about cannabis legalization, including increased consumption. The INCB claims that cannabis legalization has led to greater use, but they failed to provide any evidence to support this claim. They also cite negative health effects, 
The INCB claims that cannabis legalizations could increase negative health effects such as psychotic disorders. However, there is no scientific evidence to support this claim either. Finally, the INCB says that cannabis legalizations can target young people, saying that the cannabis industry may be targeting young people with advertising. In fact, most states that have legalized cannabis require cannabis advertising to be primarily targeted at adults. It is also noted by the INCB that the 1961 single convention on narcotics and drugs classified cannabis as highly addictive and liable to abuse, and that any non-medical or non-scientific use of cannabis contravenes that convention. Therefore, Schedule 3 makes sense before the treaty can drop it from the class entirely. We need a change in international law. And therefore, that makes Schedule 3 much more sensible because then the Attorney General is still in compliance with what the CSA says because it is injecting international law into our federal law. So therefore, all use is medical use but a prescription may or may not be required. Federal regulations for drugs do not always require a prescription for Schedule Three substances. Typically, they do come with a prescription. The traditional rule is that no controlled substance in Schedule Three or Four may be dispensed without a written or oral prescription. Such prescriptions may not be filled or refilled more than six months after the date thereof, or be refilled more than five times after the date of prescription unless reviewed by the medical practitioner. However, additional review of our federal regulations allows for over-the-counter sales of even Schedule II drugs. For example, the variant of methamphetamine is a Schedule II substance as an isomer of meth. This means that the coming rule from the Attorney General could include cannabis under the excluded substances section of 1308.22 of their federal regulations. We'll see. But maybe our little public comment to the proposed rule should be requesting that the Attorney General make adult cannabis sales lawful pursuant to over-the-counter regulations. While we are speculating that cannabis could become an over-the-counter substance, here's something that we're pretty darn sure is going to happen with a change in scheduling down to Schedule 3. IRC 280E is gone with Schedule 3. Say it with me. IRC 280 IRC 280 is gone in Schedule 3. As we have said many times on this channel, IRC 280E states that no deduction or credit shall be allowed for any amount paid or incurred during the taxable year in carrying on a trade or business if such trade or business for the activities of which comprise the trade or business consisting of trafficking in controlled substances within the meaning of Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 of the Controlled Substances Act, which is prohibited by federal law or the law of any state in which the trade or business is conducted. This has made the legal cannabis industry the highest taxed and most audited industry in the history of us in the United States. Instead of paying your taxes on net revenue, cannabis companies have to pay their taxes on gross profits, which only allows the deductions of costs of goods sold. That would be no more under Schedule 3. Huh? The businesses would be allowed to deduct ordinary business expenses, which greatly increases its profitability, especially of the dispensaries. Suffice to say, Schedule 3 cannabis is a much more profitable industry with much less audit risk, but it could still be illegal, unfortunately. The Federal Registry. Those who either distribute or manufacture cannabis would need to be registered with the Attorney General under Section 823 of the CSA. Currently, states have their own systems, regulations, and procedures for obtaining licensure and ensuring compliance. We move to Section 823 of the Controlled Substances Act. Here is the silver lining for the current operators. The Attorney General could, in theory, waive the requirements for registration of certain manufacturers and distributors, aka dispensaries, if it finds that is consistent with the public health and safety. Presumably, the reason why the Attorney General has the right to not list an applicant for its registry is if a bad actor came up. However, a more creative reading of the law could imply that an exemption is possible, and that's why the Attorney General did not require registration. A more creative reading could say that they need not do it because the state has it. 
Let's check that out. Manufacturers of controlled substances essential three, four, or five. The attorney general shall register an applicant to manufacture controlled substances in schedule three, four, or five, unless he determines that the issuance of such registration is inconsistent with the public interest. In determining the public interest, the following factors shall be considered. The maintenance of effective controls against diversion of a particular controlled substance and every controlled substance in schedule three, four, or five, and any controlled substances in schedule three, four, or five compounded therefrom into that illegitimate medicine, or compliance with applicable state and local law, or the promotion of technical advances in the art of manufacturing these substances and with developing new substances, or number four, a prior conviction recorded on the applicant for federal or state laws relating to the manufacture, distribution, or dispensing of such substances, and past experiences in the manufacturing, distribution, and dispensing of controlled substances, and the existence of the establishment of effective controls against diversion. Finally, such other factors as may be relevant and consistent with the public health and safety. Distributors of controlled substances in Schedule 3, 4, and 5 are held to the same thing. So if you're making this stuff or distributing this stuff, and we grant distribution to include dispensing, that's a stretch, by the way. But if the state licensed businesses is compliant, maybe they can register by providing their state license or exempt them from registering because they are compliant with the state law. The lawyering answer has to do with what does the exemption mean? If all the license holders have to do is fill out an application to get registered, they'll do it and they'll show you their license. Oftentimes it is a requirement of the state law to prominently display your license on the premises. What's one more form to fill out if it means that you are legal, like in complete compliance with the CSA? Imagine that, a really legal, legal cannabis industry. Would the stigma drop? Would we get censored by the social media? Who could say yet? But there is something to powerfully consider about a registered or exempt from registration Schedule 3 business. The legality that prevents crimes from related to banking. Banking gets easier, even without safe bank. 1970 didn't just bring us the Controlled Substances Act. It also brought us the Bank Secrecy Act and with it, it's anti-money laundering regulations. Here's the kicker. They literally define money laundering as any business in Schedule 1 drugs. So if you move it to Schedule 3 and have a registration or an exemption so that you are a compliant business, many crimes currently on the books simply evaporate. And that's how I like my crimes that are purely made up from the whole cloth that is law. The cloth that makes up our nation. These crimes on paper can simply go away because the words say they are no longer crimes anymore on paper, just like when they became crimes. They were just magic words. Imagine banning science and enforcing it as if it is in the real world. That is our nation's Schedule 1 cannabis crimes. Better things ahead under Schedule 3 with registered or exempt licensed businesses. Why does that new rule have to fix that? Well, more laws. The Money Laundering Control Act of 1986 made it a federal offense to reinvest funds obtained from illegal enterprises, which would be business in Schedule 1 cannabis, or even a non-registered Schedule 3 business in the marijuana industry. Banks can face fines, penalties, or even losing their charter from the FDIC for providing services to illegal <laughs> enterprises. On the other hand, in 2014, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, issued guidance for banks on properly working with cannabis businesses. However, it did not provide any federal protection from prosecution for banks for violating the Bank Secrecy Act and the Anti-Money Laundering Control Act by providing financial services to cannabis businesses. This left banks unwilling to work with the businesses in the industry and forced many of those industry participants to deal mainly in cash, which has had the effect of creating opportunities for countless robberies you read about in the paper. As of 2023, there are approximately 4,900 commercial banks in the United States. According to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, as of September 2023, there were only 812 depository institutions actively banking marijuana-related businesses, or MRBs. That comes to just 16.6% .6 of the banks in the industry are willing to bank cannabis. Do you think that number would grow if those businesses were now lawful businesses at both the state and the federal level? You bet, more banks would provide services to cannabis companies if they could be lawfully conducting their business operations. It's not going to be so simple as dropping cannabis into Schedule 3 and everything will get better. You see, Schedule 3 drug businesses are still highly regulated. Here are some of the specific regulations that apply to banks providing services to the pharmaceutical industry. We'll give you the acronym and what it means. There's the AML slash KYC. That's the Anti-Money Laundering and Know Your Customer Regulations. 
banks must verify and identify their customers and monitor their transactions for suspicious activity. Then there's BSA, the Bank Secrecy Act regulations. Banks must report certain types of transactions to the government, such as large cash deposits and suspicious wire transfers. HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act regulations. Banks must protect confidentiality of their customers' data. SOX regulations, that is the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Publicly traded companies must have their financial statements audited by independent auditors, and banks must provide them with necessary support to comply with those SOX regulations. What about, uh, we're talking about publicly traded companies. Does that mean stock market listing is out of the future? You know, speaking of these public companies, currently under Schedule 1, cannabis companies have to go and get publicly listed in Canada, where their business is lawful. However, they can't list on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ in the United States. But if all those companies are now in compliance with federal law because cannabis becomes legal for adults to buy over the counter and it requires registering their state license with the federal government, why couldn't it get listed on the United States Stock Exchanges? Think about the big pop in the cannabis IPOs after the regulations for legal cannabis are sorted out in the coming years. But since we are talking about cannabis companies going public, doesn't that mean that we could have interstate commerce? Would we have medical cannabis nationwide? Technically, a Schedule Three substance would be legal across all 50 states. Section 903 of the CSA is a federal law that preempts state laws on the subject of controlled substances, but only to the extent that there is a positive conflict between the two. A positive conflict happens when two laws cannot be reconciled and cannot both stand together. In other words, Section 903 protects states' rights to regulate controlled substances unless that law directly contradicts with the CSA. For example, state law that keeps marijuana under its own version of the CSA in Schedule 1 would be preempted by the CSA once it gets rescheduled to Schedule 3. Think about that. What if, for no good reason at all, by the way, I moved to Indiana as a medical patient from Illinois? Could Indiana arrest me if I go get my medicine and bring it across the state lines? Well, yes, but would they get away with it? No, I'm a patient accessing my medicine. A physician said that I could have. Schedule 903 of the CSA will invalidate the remaining states without a good THC-based medical cannabis program. And they still have about 12 of those states out there that have no medical cannabis or just a low THC medical program. Those states are gonna have to change under Schedule 3 cannabis. The Supreme Court has interpreted Section 903 narrowly, holding that it only preempts state laws that are in direct conflict with the CSA. The court has also held that Section 903 does not preempt any state laws that are simply different from the CSA or that occupy the same field of regulation under the CSA. Because under the anti-commandeering doctrine, states assert that they cannot be coerced by the federal government to implement any federal policy. This means that the states can choose or choose to not implement federal policy within their own jurisdictions. However, the federal government can challenge a state outright in federal court. And unfortunately, the anti-commandeering doctrine is not the supreme law of the land. The United States has taken states to court over state policies and a state that does not move cannabis to Schedule 3 and tries to keep it illegal is clearly in conflict with federal law and violates Section 903 of the Controlled Substances Act. So while many people are scared that Schedule 3 cannabis is actually a rollback of where we are now, that's simply not in sync with the past 25 years of advancing policies toward legalization that has over 23 states with full adult use and soon all 50 states with medical cannabis. And if you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing and click the like button as it greatly helps grow the channel. Tune in on Sundays for the podcast or visit me online at CannabisIndustryLawyer.com.